The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. On this episode of Bizarre Murders, Fire! an arson allegedly sent by local gangs uncovers the actions of a reclusive anti-drug crusader. She's going around sticking her nose in everyone's business. The heinous plot of a diehard partier. If you want the bottle so badly, go and drink it. A tale of twisted family loyalty and revenge. And one dead body. Leaves police with the loathsome job of sifting through the ashes, looking for the murderer. Nobody should die that way. I've never seen anything that horrific. One of the duties of a pathologist is to determine the cause of death. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Kimmy is a quiet, unassuming 55-year-old woman who recently retired from her job as a dental hygienist. How are we doing? All right. A little drowsy? Yeah. She built herself a nice little nest egg and had plans to spend the rest of her days enjoying her retirement. That was the plan until her house is torched, a gas-fueled inferno that could only be the work of arsonists. So glad she wanted to tell me what's going on here. Listen, you got to do something about this woman. Detective Grant, the responding officer, learns that Kimmy, while quiet, is very protective of her neighborhood. She's going around sticking her nose in everyone's business, and it's okay. just driving us all nuts. She's been on a personal crusade to take down the drug dealers who are taking over her neighborhood. She's even gone as far as installing cameras on her porch to gather evidence against the drug dealers and then sending the tapes to police to shame them into doing something. People were taking notice. So here we have a quiet middle-aged woman who likes to knit, who's decided to take the law into her own hands. In my experience as a former FBI agent, that is never a good idea. I get it, you want to do something, it's her neighborhood. But when you play with fire, you will get burned. Kimmy's house has been torched at least two times before, luckily without too much damage. But the drug dealer's scare tactics don't deter her. If anything, it fuels her personal fire to clean up her neighborhood. She's the problem here, and you gotta do something about it. While some neighbors see Kimmy as a superhero with her anti-drug crusade. We can't I'll put up with it. this anymore. I'll look into it. Others think she's being reckless endangering the neighborhood further, and that she has to be stopped. And today's top story, local woman being heralded as a hero after her home is burned to the ground, and what police suspect is retribution by local drug dealers. The news of Kimmy's heroic fight against the city's drug dealers goes citywide. Neighbors say the woman was leading the fight against drugs and corruption in the community. Throngs of well-wishers send money to cover her medical expenses. A contractor offers to rebuild her house and the governor offers a reward for help with the case. You're making me blush, stop. Overnight, she's gone from zero to hero. When a case is splashed all over the news, it's a double-edged sword. It can be good and it can be bad. The good news is that it can drum up lots of leads and potential suspects. The bad news is it can drum up lots of leads because chasing those leads involves a lot of manpower and most of the leads end up being dead ends. But the one thing you can always count on when the media is all over a case, it's going to put a lot of pressure on you to solve the crime and fast. Hi, Kimmy. Hello. 
I'm Detective Grant. Oh, nice to meet you. With neighborhood interviews turning up little to no information, Detective Grant arrives at the hospital to question Kimmy. <laughs> You've become quite a sensation. People have been very kind to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, have you had any arguments or disagreements with anyone in your neighborhood recently? Not directly, no. And this was your family home. Mm -hmm. When the investigators interview victims or perpetrators, they're looking as much at how things are being said as what is being said. Is there anything that doesn't quite fit? And Kimmy does not come across as the reserved woman people claim she is. So what could this mean? Is it trauma from the fire? Is she still in shock? Or is there something else going on? Do you think there's anyone else besides drug dealers who might have burned your house down? No. The one question the cops can't shake, if drug dealers wanted Kimmy out of the way for retribution, why would they burn her house down? It's just not their style. Detective Grant reaches out to his informants. Yeah, it's Grant. To size up if they know anything about both the fire and drug dealers who might have had a vendetta against Kimmy. But no one has even heard of her. It makes sense that there are no solid leads coming from the street. I mean, junkies and drug dealers don't get revenge like that. More pokers are needed for this fire. These punks are more gun and knives people. Either way, they wouldn't risk the heat of killing a civilian. I'm no mathematician, but this doesn't add up. Suspecting there's more to this crime than meets the eye, Detective Grant starts digging into Kimmy's personal life. What you doing? Hey, hi, sweetie. How are you? Um, I'm pretty good. Turns out she has a sister. Enough of that. Karen. I'm making your favorite chocolate chip cookies. You're so good to me. <laughs> who has lived with her for the past 15 years. Hey, you're looking a bit wobbly there. Yeah, I'm good. I'm okay. Good. Yeah. And where Kimmy is reserved and quiet, Karen is a partier with shady friends and is known to make bad decisions. I can see something there. I have a favor to ask. I yeah, have shoot, a shoot, date Luke. tonight. A date? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Maybe you should stop drinking so much before oh, the date. No, no, I'm just getting loose. I got a party hearty tonight oh, because I'm okay. going to impress them. The neighbors talk about how close the two sisters are, that they even look alike. So I need to borrow $200 from you. But they also often hear them arguing. <laughs> I just gave you $400. I know, but that was just for living stuff. Especially over money. It's going to be such a special night, please. Kimmy supports Karen, giving her an allowance. I'm going to have to say that the door is closed on the bank today, Kimmy. Which she quickly burns through. Don't look at me that way, please. I've done nothing Come would support on. you. You know this is special. You, you need, need to so stop that. To you need to stop. I'm not going to fight you over it. You want the bottle so badly? Go and drink. Go on. That's where the money seems oh, to be I going can't anyway. You're doing this. I'm sorry, this is for your own good. How do they look? I don't wear them that often, so I'm going to depend on you. Oh, they look fabulous. OK, and where do you want me to look for just, them? Just straighten the lens and talk to your audience. OK. And go. I don't know who set fire to my house, but I do know that they wanted me dead. Detective Grant returns to the hospital to question Kimmy. It will take a lot more than setting fire to my house four times. And is once again met by a media circus. From the dirty, rotten drug dealers that have infested our streets. Great. Good job. Thank you. So, Kimmy, I understand you have a sister which you conveniently left out the first time we spoke. It must have slipped my mind from the trauma of the fire. Kimmy reveals that Karen left for Atlantic City with her boyfriend a few days before the arson. So Kimmy has a sister, Karen, who looks a lot like her, and this is the first investigators are hearing about it? That is a red flag if I've ever seen one. And there's a second red flag. Where is Karen? Her sister Kimmy's face has been plastered all over the news and not even a phone call to check in. Something does not smell right. Working a hunch, Detective Grant returns to Kimmy's home with the arson team. This time, looking for evidence of a crime the fire was meant to cover up. He discovers a freezer 
blackened from the fire and wrapped in what seems to be duct tape. Inside are remains that appear to be human. The fire has melted the freezer seals, letting in the heat and essentially turning the freezer into an oven. Grant's hunch was right. The fire was a cover-up. This case has gone from arson to a murder investigation like that. The question is, whose baked remains are those in the freezer? Yeah, I'm looking for the patient in room 4A. She checked herself out. Against doctor's orders, Kimmy has discharged herself, okay, taking with her several large donation checks she received from her well-wishers. OK, can we toss out the theory that drug dealers were targeting the house? Clearly, something more sinister is going on. Our little miss hero, Kimmy, has some talking to do. What else do I need? <laughs> I'm on a vacation. Kimmy cashes out on some of that sympathy money. In particular, a $2,500 check from a generous donor. <laughs> Find a body, lose a body. This investigation is stalled again. We put out a bolo, or for those not as familiar with police jargon, be on the lookout to track the victim, who may now be a perpetrator, but actually, it's two now. Both sisters are unaccounted for. This is an all-points bulletin, and that's APB. With both Kimmy and Karen missing, the investigation has stalled. But then Detective Grant catches a lucky break. Please, open up. He gets a tip that Kimmy has been seen checking into a motel. Detective Grant, surprised to see you here. Hi, Kimmy. So, uh, what are you doing here? Hey, I'm chilling out and I'm relaxing. It was a tough time in the hospital. Oh, yeah. So I've got a few questions for you. OK. Maybe you'll come downtown, have a little chat. Again? Yeah. OK, yep. I'll just uh, get my things and, all right, um, OK. Whose body's in your freezer? Oh, detective, I've told you a hundred times already. I don't know whose body is in the freezer. Detective Grant grills Kimmy for hours. Well, where's your sister, Karen? Again, as I've said, she's in Atlantic City. Atlantic City? Yes. Okay. But Kimmy insists that she doesn't know where in Atlantic City Karen is staying and has no way of contacting her. I'll be back. With the interrogation sitting at a stalemate, a surprising document falls into Detective Grant's lap. Turns out, another family member who lives in a different town has filed a missing persons report on Kimmy. What? Because family members haven't seen or heard from her in over a month. I'd like to think that we can get the facts straight as investigators were able to see the forest for the trees. But even I'm confused by this one. The woman sitting in the interrogation room is Kimmy. But now there's a missing person's report for Kimmy. Then who is sitting in that chair in the interrogation room? Yeah, it's Grant. This report, uh, is this for real? When Detective Grant receives the autopsy report, things go from strange to bizarre. The coroner has determined the body in the freezer has been stabbed multiple times, then chopped up with an ax, bagged, and stuffed into the freezer over a month ago. You're sure about this? The coroner also has ID on the body. All right.
So who are you? Excuse me, I'm Kimmy. I just got off the phone with the coroner. That body in your freezer, that's Kimmy. That can't be. They must have made a mistake. The autopsy report states that the body parts lying in the morgue belong to Kimmy. And yet even when confronted with this evidence, she stands by her story. This situation is particularly strange because you have someone who's been on TV all over the nation, a case the FBI would call a special, a high profile case that can possibly speed up solving the crime. First, Kimmy's the victim of a crime by supposed drug dealers. Then she's reported as missing when she clearly isn't. Now she's supposed to be dead, lying on a slab in the morgue. Is Kimmy really Karen or is Karen really Kimmy? The only way to prove who is who is with fingerprints. But to get a match, whoever Kimmy really is will have to have a criminal record with prints on file. So, you want to tell me what Kimmy was doing in your freezer? Unlike people, fingerprints don't lie. Kimmy's prints match those of a woman arrested for prostitution 10 years earlier. And wait for it, the prints belong to none other than the elusive sister, Karen. Single white female, anyone? Faced with the incontrovertible proof of her identity, the woman claiming to be Kimmy comes clean. All right, I'm Karen. Ah, look at Kimmy baking again. I, I'm making your favorite chocolate chip. Oh, that's really sweet of you. Listen, I've, uh, I met this guy. Ooh, that's exciting. Oh, yeah, maybe. And uh, I need some money. I'm out of money. Oh, Karen, I just gave you 400. Well, that's... that was two days ago, Kimmy. Come on, you know how it is. Oh, I, I'm really tired of this. I, I am. Would you just stop drinking? No, I'm not going to stop drinking. I think I'll have another one. No, no, no. Don't touch me! All I want is some money. Don't you touch me again. I'm not giving you any more money. But there's another twist in store for detectives. I swear to you, on my mother's best china, I did not kill my sister, Kimmy. I don't buy it, Karen. You're the only one who had anything to gain by her death. You gotta come clean. It wasn't me. Detective Grant charges Karen with murder and fraud. It turns out Karen was impersonating her sister, Kimmy, and a big part of the reason she was able to get away with it for so long is that the sisters looked a lot alike. But once you've caught up her bread handed, finding out the rest of the story is just knocking the first domino down. Under mounting pressure in the courtroom and faced with the undeniable evidence against her, Kimmy finally cracks and spills the beans on the entire sordid affair. Kimmy was tired of being Karen's meal ticket, and when she learned her sister had forged her signature to cash four of her annuity checks. What are these? It's no big deal, they're checks. They're just checks. They're checks with my name on them. She threatens That's to it. cut her off. It's over. I... What do you mean it's over? I want you out. To the outside world, the look-alike sisters appear close. But in reality, Karen harbors a deep-seated resentment towards Kimmy. After all uh, that I've done, I'm so tired of hearing about everything that you've done for me. You're right, I'm a worthless piece of cow manure. She envies her success and money, and she's not happy with the meager allowance Kimmy gives her. Get out! This is my house, too. When Karen saw her personal ATM closing its door, she came up with a new retirement plan. If Kimmy wasn't going to take care of Karen, then Karen was going to take care of Kimmy. As far as motives go, this is one we see every day, greed. Karen wanted Kimmy's annuities and the fire insurance money. What we don't see every day is someone cutting up their sister, putting the pieces in a freezer, and then setting the house on fire. 
that takes it to the next level. I'm no psychologist, but the word I have for a person who can do that with no remorse is psychopath. Karen had assumed Kimmy's identity, <laughs> allowing her access to her sister's insurance policies, bank accounts, and retirement checks. The media attention and cash donations from well-wishers was a happy bonus. Karen had everyone fooled for the short time she was Kimmy, despite the fact that the lookalike sisters had completely different personalities. And she really was a chameleon, able to change herself into who she needed to be to get what she wanted, and that is, at least until she got caught. In the act of burning the family home for insurance money, Karen herself got burned. Karen is found guilty of murder and fraud-related charges. She's sentenced to life without the chance of parole. In all my years as an investigator, I've seen a lot of truly bizarre cases. But a sister killing her own sister and then impersonating her for money, and then become famous for it? She's a fiery one. She had everyone duped and it was bold, I'll give her that. But that kind of daring doesn't last for long. The law always wins. The events in this program are inspired by a true story. Names, dates, and details have been changed. Viewer discretion is advised. <laughs> On this episode of Bizarre Murders, a summer town where hundreds of people are out enjoying what the beach and the bars have to offer. Local police have their hands full with drunken disorderlies and petty crimes. But what looks like a bungled burglary down in your knees. takes investigators down a dark and twisted path that's anything but fun in the sun. Tibby Island is a beach town near Savannah, Georgia. On the off season, it's laid back and quiet. But starting on Memorial Day weekend, its population explodes with vacationers looking to let their hair down and have a good time on and off the beach. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy a vacation as much as anyone else, maybe more. But as a former FBI agent, I've seen tourists do some risky things, things they'd never think of doing at home. You know, like the saying goes, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But in my experience, it's that kind of thinking, or rather not thinking, that can get you into trouble. All along the Strip, people are in a holiday weekend party mode. Like Carrie and Mike who've driven down to Tibby Island for the long weekend. They met at work a year ago. Barely a month into their relationship, they move in together. This is their first vacation as a couple. All right. But maybe. <laughs> These two hardly know each other, and now they're away for the first time in Party Central. We might be in for an episode of Couple Gone Wild. At the bar, Carrie and Mike's private party of two is about to expand. You guys are okay oh. if we can take this out of the bar, right? Oh, sure, please. Yeah. It's free country. Welcome. It's all yours. <laughs> I'm Lacey, by the way. Hi. Hi. Carrie. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Lacey and Jason are a young married couple in town for a two week vacation. Lacey met Jason at a party in college. She was a volleyball star, he was a Marine. Three weeks into their relationship, they elope to Las Vegas. What's that saying? Fools rush in? Well, we've got two couples that are pretty impetuous when it comes to relationships. You bring them together, and it's anybody's guess what's going to go down. Cheers. Very quickly, the two couples hit it off. <laughs> A few hours and many drinks later, the two couples are acting like they've known each other forever. 
Vacation Brain has a way of making everybody fast friends. Of course, throwing a whole lot of booze into the mix doesn't hurt either. But alcohol has a way of lowering inhibitions and dulling your senses. Let's just say your judgment might not be the most astute. Why don't we head back? Mm -hmm. Last call's approaching. But Lacey and Carrie are not ready for the night to be over. <laughs> Go back to our beach house. I that is, love it. Uh, uh, that is a good idea if ever I heard one. Lacey and Jason are staying in a beach house rental of Tibby Island's most upscale condo complex. <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> oh, hey, we're on camera now. <laughs> <laughs> Take a photo. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Come here, come here. All right. Uh -oh. All right. You got this. All right, show me the magic. All right, you are a vision of loveliness. Excellent. There we are. Fantastic. Beautiful ring. Thank you. Thank you very much. Look for it. It's Wait, okay. Yeah, yeah, Bruce, just left I saw you eyeing it at the bar. We didn't do a thing. Oh, it's please. okay. You commented on it, and I know you stole it. Where is it? But I would not. Please calm down. Don't tell please me to calm, calm down. down. No. Four total strangers under the influence. Great. Inhibitions are low, so it's no surprise emotions are running high. We're in dangerous territory now. There's no way to actually know what anyone will do or what they're really up to. The next day, it would appear that the previous night's drama was resolved. Come on, Dave, let's go. Ready, baby? Let's go. Jason and Lacey head out, taking full advantage of what Tibby Island has to offer. Okay, you are gonna go right there. Later, surrounded by her crafting tools, Lacey documents every moment of the weekend in her scrapbook. Perfect. She's been scrapbooking since she was a kid and a little obsessed with it. Cute. Oh, what a wonderful day. Meanwhile, Carrie and Mike are no-shows for work. All right, so how long? Oh, okay, so ever in that 15 years did he ever show up late? I even miss a meeting. It's not uncommon for people to extend their vacations. Rick, am I right? Yeah, it, it happens all the time. Bye. Past behavior is usually a good indicator of future behavior. People aren't as wild and crazy as they'd like to think. In fact, the vast majority act according to predictable patterns. If Carrie and Mike have a history of being dependable, then not showing up for work should raise flags. After three days and still no sign of Mike or Carrie, the police launch an official investigation. They distribute posters and post them around town. Detectives go to the couple's rental condo and find their car still parked in the driveway. Suitcases look like they're still being lived out of. Clothes on the bed. Inside, Carrie and Mike's personal items appear untouched. Toothbrush looks like it has been used not too long ago. Except there's no trace of their IDs, purse, or wallets. No IDs could mean that Carrie and Mike have taken off on their own, or they've met with foul play. Missing persons cases are some of the toughest investigations you'll get. There's no body, there's no obvious crime scene, and people don't just vanish in a puff of smoke. They usually leave some trace behind. Actually, the fact that they disappeared without a trace is evidence in and of itself. 
So where do you start? You start with motive. You start by digging into their background. Detectives do background checks on the couple and discover that Mike's cousin was murdered two years before. They wonder if he might have killed Carrie and gone on the run. Hi. Hi, there's Detective Suarez. Can I speak to Michelle, please? Yes, Michelle. Um, I'm calling in regards to your ex-husband, Mike. But all the people they interview, including his ex-wife, the mother of his daughter, swear Mike is the kindest person they know. Kindest? OK. He was absolutely devoted to Carrie. He's simply not capable of murder. Detectives track Mike's credit card to a popular bar on the Strip. When they question the bar staff, nobody remembers seeing Carrie and Mike. No evidence or witnesses. That's a surefire sign of a case that could easily go cold. This is usually when you hope to catch a lucky break. And if you're hoping for a break, you're in trouble. And if there's one thing I've learned in my career, that break usually comes when the killer gets cocky and does something stupid. They may be criminals, but they are not Einsteins. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to the police, the last two people Carrie and Mike might have been seen with have an itch they need to scratch. Turns out, Jason and Lacey are anything but the all-American couple. Jason was dishonorably discharged from the Marines for bad conduct. And soon after they got married, they got into partying and serious drugs. But the novelty wears off quickly, and burglary becomes their new rush. And their preferred fix? Ripping off the adult sex store chain busted. As gross as it sounds, for some people, committing a crime gives them the same thrill and excitement as does sex. But get away with it once, and you start to get overconfident. And that's when things can go sideways. Trust me, sooner or later, you're going to have an off night. Lacey and Jason have no idea they've tripped the silent alarm. Step away from the car. Down on your knees, put your hands behind your head. Take the masks off, now. Caught in the act, Lacey starts to have a full-blown panic attack. On your back. Please, I need my anxiety meds, please. Where are they? They're in my purse. A burglar that suffers from panic attacks? I'm not sure she's in the right line of work. What is all this? But instead of pills, he finds Carrie and Mike's IDs. What is this? I, I, I don't know who they are. I found them on the beach. When police search their car, they find a loaded Glock. Things aren't looking too good for our missing couple, Carrie and Mike. This suggests to police that Lacey and Jason are into something more nefarious than your run-of-the-mill b &Es. There's no doubt these two are not in the right line of work. Instead of laying low, they commit a petty crime. They get caught and happen to be carrying incriminating evidence on them. Can you spell D-U-M? B? Detectives suspect Jason and Lacey of kidnapping Carrie and Mike, given the items they were carrying during their arrest. But there's no sign of Carrie or Mike at Jason and Lacey's beach house rental. Instead, they find empty bullet casings, a missing door to a bedroom, paint, and cleaning supplies. And on the carpet near the bed, two more cartridges with what looks like dried blood on them. And on the side of the bed, blood stains. The lengths people will go to try and cover up a crime always gets me. But a word to the wise, there's no way a lick of fresh paint will ever eliminate all the traces of blood and DNA. And if you're going to murder someone, you might not want to leave spent bullet casings lying around in plain sight. All right, Jason. I've got a lot of time. Where are they? As CSI continue to search the house, detectives put Jason in the hot seat. I know you know where they are. DNA's right over here. Nothing? 
why is the door missing from your door frame? Why are there cleaning supplies? Why is there paint? Doing a little remodeling? No? Let's see if you start speaking with these. Shell casings found in your apartment. Is that for the mister? This one for the missus? Where are they, Jason? But Jason's not saying a thing. To make a murder conviction stick beyond a reasonable doubt, you need bodies. But if one member of this criminal tag team isn't talking, that's when you go work the other. You know what this is right here? DNA report. I don't know what you're talking about. You know what I'm talking about? It was a rental, it wasn't my place. Oh yeah? Well then, explain this. Bullet casings found in the apartment one and number two. Tell me where they are, all right? At this point, it's you against Jason. You need to do what's right. Detectives present Lacey with a proposition. Okay. Reduce time if she tells them what happened. Jason did it. He fired two bullets through the door and... Lacey tells police that Jason killed both victims and forced her to help him with the cover-up. He forced me to clean it up. She claims she's terrified of him. You don't understand, he's crazy. When he got back from the Marines, he wasn't the same. He'd have night terrors and he had to have everything a certain way. And he, he bought a, a gun for me for protection. Wake up! Lacey, wake up, I gotta do something. <laughs> come on, come on, get up, get up. Are you ready? You ready? Do you wanna see it? <laughs> Take it. I don't want it. Take it! He became fascinated with killing. He talked about murdering someone completely random. Bang! No obvious motive makes it easier to get away with it. And he wanted Lacey Bang! to help. You like it? Mm -hmm. You love it, don't you? Yeah, it's ours now. Okay. I love, I love you. But I was scared I was going to have to use it to him. It's not unusual for an abused wife to fall in line because she fears retaliation from her husband. And Lacey just painted a pretty compelling picture of Jason's motive and means for targeting Carrie and Mike. They were complete strangers. Right now, he looks good as the mastermind behind the murders. See, I gave you an opportunity to come clean, but it's fine, because Lacey said you did it. But when detectives tell Jason, Lacey pinned the murder on him, he breaks his silence. She's insane. She's completely insane. Jason tells police that once they got married, Lacey became increasingly jealous and possessive and wanted him to cut all ties with his Marine buddies. Hey, babe. She would freak out if he even got home late. Where have you been? Where have you been, work. Jason? I was at work. You were at work yeah. this late? And you didn't call? OK, you I. You were out with your friends, weren't you? Only for a bit. We were just Marine talking. Marine friends, weren't you? Is that who you were out with? Babe, I'm, I'm sorry. What I... did I tell you about those guys? I told you not to see them. And I'm, and I'm sorry. Baby, Don't cool, get near babe. me. I wasn't there when it happened. I was asleep in my car. I didn't even hear the shots. When I came in, they were both already dead. She was freaking out. Yeah, I, I, I helped her cut up the bodies. Jason claims Lacey's the real killer. I can't tell you how common it is during an interrogation at the FBI for people to turn on their supposed loved ones to save their own skin. Till death do us part, right? No. Apparently, he was napping in his car when Lacey killed Mike and Carrie in a drug and alcohol-induced rage. He just helped her dismember and dispose of the bodies. Oh, is that all? No problem. Police need to find Mike and Carrie's bodies. That's the only way they're going to figure out what really happened that night and make sure neither of these two lovebirds get away with murder. 
after striking a deal for a more lenient sentence in exchange for her cooperation. Lacey tells the police she and Jason drove across state lines and dumped Mike and Carrie's bodies in a dumpster. Police find the partial remains in a landfill. The only part of Carrie they recover is her right arm. All they find of Mike is his upper torso and head. The lab removes a slug from Mike's head, and it matches the Glock the police found in Jason and Lacey's car. The evidence CSI has collected from the beach house rental is filling in the blanks. But it's Lacey's scrapbook that seals the deal. In it, there's a photo of Lacey wearing Mike's ring on a chain around her neck. Keeping souvenirs to sit back and relive the crime over and over is sick, but it's something killers do because they're sick. But most don't lay them out in a collage with pretty paper and glitter and hearts. The evidence does not support our scrapbooker's claim that her husband did all the dirty work. Part of Lacey's plea deal Lacey? is to pass a polygraph test first. What I've done here. Crazy for scrapbooking. But when she's confronted with the scrapbook, she cracks. There we got you, sporty me. Nice little butterflies, butterflies your thing. Oh, the best day ever. You guys can recreate this photo in the prison chapel. Ooh. Fine. Met them at the bar. And they came back to the house and things got a little out of hand. Yeah, you are gonna help me find it because you know exactly where it is. Just calm down. Just tell us the bar. Yeah. Oh, my God, are you? Help! Shit! 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 I knew they weren't gonna get away. Come on. You wanna do it? Do it. Let's do it. Do it, Jason! <laughs> you monster! For his part in the crime, Jason is convicted of murder and sentenced to 40 years. As for Lacey, she's convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life, plus 25 years. What baffles me about this murder is that these two couples didn't even know each other. Carrie and Mike were simply at the wrong place at the wrong time. Lacey and Jason aren't your average killers either. It's a case of committing murder simply for kicks. When drugs and partying stop doing it for them, they turn to burglary to get their fix. And when that wore thin, they decided to kill for sport. They needed a higher dose. They treated the entire crime like some game. Absolutely no remorse. The only motive here is the thrill and excitement of not getting caught. They brought out the worst in each other. She was the dynamite and he was the match and together, the thrill may be gone, but at least Lacey's, she's still got her scrapbook. My life inside.